My apologies, some technical difficulties over here. I believe we've got it going now. So uh, hopefully everyone can hear me. Welcome, welcome, welcome. All right, I'm gonna get right into it and share my screen. And I'm gonna go to the CompuCram screen. There you go, can you still hear me? Uh, thumbs up or I don't see anyone necessarily. Everybody's got their cameras off or uh, is everyone still in the room? Uh, you can throw it in the chat if you can hear me. Hopefully we're not still having technical difficulty. Hey, Mariano, uh, you were muted. Hello, hello, how are you, sir? I'm well and yourself. Uh, so you can hear me. Uh, are you able to see my screen? You're muted again. Yes, I can. I tried to log in from my computer. Okay. All right. So for the, for the national portion of the exam, there are four categories that are the, the most important. 53 of your 80 questions are going to fall in line with these four categories. So it's going to be contracts, practice of real estate, and then general principles of agency and financing. So the majority of your questions in the exam are gonna be in those four categories. So we're gonna jump right in and start with financing. So let's go ahead and launch the practice test. All right, so uh, this is interactive, so throw it in the chat um, when you, and, and Mariana, you've get, still got your hand up, so if you take your hand down, uh, that way I, I know you don't need me to, to check in on you. All right, there we go. Okay, so throw your answers in the chat, and we will start off with a lump sum payment of principal is due at the end in which type of promissory note? Major, wraparound, balloon, or fully amortized? So we can go one, two, three, four. So put your answers in the chat. A lump sum payment of principal is due at the end in which type of promissory note? Balloon. There you go. So we've got one balloon. There are other people in this chat. Or right, is everyone having uh, trouble? Okay, so answer is balloon, and that is correct. So balloon is the right answer. And so the uh, balloon mortgage is one where the lump sum payment is uh, principal is due at the end. A fully amortized mortgage would not have a lump sum payment. It would be paid out over the life of the loan. And uh, you know, generally the last payment is either the same or smaller than the rest. A wraparound note covers more than one loan. There's no such thing as a major note. And if you'll excuse me for just a moment, I'm sorry. All right, my apologies. You know, the life of uh, Zoom with children, right? All right, so. Uh, there's no such thing as a major note. So that's the other one there. All right, next question. The seizing of property by court order as security for a debt or judgment is known as one, alienation, two, capitalization, three, encumbrance, or four, attachment. So the Ali seizing of pro I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry, alienation. Alienation? Anyone else? Any other responses? Feel free to put it in the chat. All 
So I'm going to click on alienation and we're going to check the answer, but I know it's not right. It's attachment. So the seizing of property by court order is attachment. Usually the property is attached to be sold at public auction or to satisfy a judgment. So that's why they call it attachment because it's attached to the sale um, either at public auction or satisfying a judgment. Uh, so they attach it. Alienation is actually transferring an interest in real property. So alienation is when the interest transfers to someone else. So an encumbrance is a burden on a person's title and capitalization is the calculation of value according to income and rate of return. So capitalization rate uh, is a way that you can remember that because that's a you know that's an investment term. So alienation, uh, so the seizing of property by court order as security for a debt or judgment is known as attachment. All right, if a lender is charging a borrower an interest rate of 5% and also charging the borrower two points, what is the lender's yield? So they're charging the borrower 5% and also charging the borrower two points. One, seven percent, two, five and a quarter, three, seven and a quarter, or four, ten percent. So we got Anna says seven percent. Everyone agree? So the answer is actually five and a quarter. So the lender's yield is the rate of interest points, uh, interest plus points. So 5% equals 0.25, which is two points. Um, so 5.25% when calculating the points for exam, remember it takes eight points to equal 1% of interest. So 1% is eight points. And so it's, if you have eight, eight points, uh, each point equals 0.125 per point. So two points is, uh, times two times 0.125 is 0.25. So eight points to equal 1% of interest. So a point isn't a full interest point, okay? Next question. While both the mortgage deed and the mortgage note are assigned by the borrower, the note is one, not really necessary, not recorded. Number three, signed in duplicate with a copy each for the buyer and the bank, or four, retained by the borrower as a reminder of its maturity date. So while both the mortgage deed and the mortgage note are signed by the borrower, the note is one, two, three, or four. I can't answer until you do. So chime in anytime. So we know the deed is recorded at the county. So we're talking about the note now. So it is signed by the borrower, but is it not really necessary? Or is it not recorded? Or is it signed in duplicate with a copy each for the buyer in the bank? Or is it retained by the borrower as a reminder of its maturity date? I think the last one, retained by the borrower as a reminder of the maturity date. Okay. So I'm gonna click on that one and it is incorrect. It is not recorded. So the deed is recorded, the mortgage note is not recorded. So it's the deed creates a lien on a property. The note is actually just a personal promissory note that's retained by the bank. So it's held by the bank and it's not signed in duplicate as this would create two debts. So you only have you know a note is you saying that you owe the debt. So, you know, if they had two, they could both be called by the bank. So you'd only sign it once and it is held by the bank and not necessarily the borrower. So that's why it's not, you know, the buyer and that's why it's not this one either. So it's only held by the bank. So, and you'll find that questions are like this in the exam where it's almost right and one part of it would be wrong. 
And the reason they do this is because when you're dealing with offers and creating contracts, uh, it's very important for you to make sure that you're reading through it to understand each part so that your buyers or your sellers are being protected by you. Your job is to make sure that you're looking through it for any discrepancies that might cause harm or um, aren't in your buyer or seller's best and your client's best interest. So you're not an attorney. You're never supposed to write these things in or do anything like that. And at the same time, understanding how they work is important. So a mortgage is recorded to assure amortization payments, one, two, comply with truth and lending regulations, three, create a valid lien, or four, transfer title to the mortgagee. So we actually just had this answer in the last question. So a mortgage is recorded to one, two, three, or four. All right. Anyone? Anyone? Bueller? Bueller? Four. All right, I got four in the chat. So transfer a title to the mortgagee. So I'm gonna write this one, but it's to create a valid lien. So it's this one. So it's number three. So transfer a title to the mortgagee. Transferring title, um, that happens once it's paid off because you're creating a lien on the property for the bank because until it's paid off, the title isn't transferred to the mortgagee. Uh, the title is actually held by the bank. So the mortgage is not a lien until it's been recorded and that's why it's recorded with the county. And it still may be binding between the bank and the purchaser, but it would not create a lien on the property. Therefore, subsequent purchasers could not be held to have knowledge of the mortgage. So the Truth in Lending Act requires that the buyer be given a loan estimate of the cost of interest, loan payments, et cetera, and does not require that the mortgage be recorded. So it's, it's to give knowledge of the mortgage. And that's why that's how it creates a valid lien by being recorded. And anytime, feel free to stop me at any of these questions. All right, number six, property is attached in order to provide security for payment of a debt or judgment. We, and remember, we went over attachment, compute cost of replacement value, construct zoning boundary lines, or compute valuation for mortgage loan purposes. So when we talk about attachment, all right, number one. So there we go. Yes, attachment is a court order seizure of property. So that is the correct answer. The taking of another person's rights and obligations in a pre-existing contract is known as novation, ostensible liability, assumption, or assignment. So the taking of another person's rights and obligations in a pre-existing contract is known as. So I've got number three. I got D, so it's a toss up between these two. Anyone else want to be the tiebreaker here between assumption and assignment? No, all right, I'm gonna go with the last one chosen. So it is assumption. So assumption involves the taking or receiving of another person's rights. Assignment is the giving of a person's rights and interests. So you're assigning your rights and the person receiving it is assuming the rights. So that's the difference. So while assignment is without release of liability, novation does release a withdrawing party from liability under a contract. And so a broker, for example, has what is known as ostensible liability. The broker is always liable for any discrimination by her agents, whether or not the broker knows about the discriminatory, discriminatory acts or not. So that's ostensible liability. Novation again is a release a withdrawing party from liability under a contract. Assumption is the person receiving and assignment is the giving of the, of the contract. A partially amortized note that reduces part of the principal by the time the final payment is due is often called a wraparound mortgage, balloon payment, balloon note, 
amortized loan or a conventional loan. So number partially two. amortized. I'm sorry, say again. I believe it's in number two, balloon number payment, two. balloon note. Okay. Uh, so a partially amortized note that reduces part of the principal by the time the final payment is due is often called a, so a balloon would be if that payment is due all at once. It, it has that end payment. So a partially amortized loan. So would you, you know, cause they're saying it's a partially amortized note that reduces part of the principal by the time final payment is due is either a conventional loan, wraparound mortgage or fully amortized loan. So I've got three and I've got two. Anyone else uh, want to chime in? Let me see. So I got two threes. All right, everyone's saying fully amortized loan. So that is incorrect. Number two was correct, balloon payment. I was actually wrong. I, I, uh, uh, Mariano had it right. So I read that incorrectly. So balloon payment, a balloon note is a partially amortized with the lump sum payment of the principal due at the end of the loan. So yeah, partially amortized note that reduces part of the principal by the time the final payment is due is called a balloon. Because it is, yeah, if it was fully amortized, then it would pay out, it would break down the whole amount of the loan. So that's what amortization is. It's the breaking down of the payment for the full amount. So if it was fully amortized, that would pay off the whole loan. Partially amortized does mean that there's a lump sum at the end that would have to be paid. So I read that incorrectly. Mariano had it right. Way to go. A blanket mortgage involves a loan with a balloon payment at the end, two, a fully amortized mortgage, three, a single loan with two or more parcels of property offered as security, or two loans combined into one interest rate? Number three. All right, I see in the chat, people are answering C, that is correct. So a blanket mortgage is a single loan with two or more parcels offered as security for a loan. Wraparound mortgage is when two separate mortgages are wrapped into one and combined at a new interest rate. So that's what a wraparound mortgage is the letter, you know, D or number four. And we just talked about balloon payment. Uh, so we're pretty good there. So let's move on. The obligation or promise to be personally liable for conditions in another person's contract is known as assumption, ostensible liability, assignment, or novation. All right, so we got C. I believe C's it's a uh, C's assignment. assignment. Oh. All right, we got a C and a D. So remember, assignment is when you're actually giving. Assumption is when you're receiving. So you're promising to be personally liable for the conditions in someone else's loan. So by receiving that loan, you're assuming it. So that's the person be, being held responsible. So it's assumption. So, you know, the giving of one person's contract rights to another is assignment. So when you give it to someone else, that's assignment. Hold on, you gotta admit somebody, there we go. Um, and the promise to be liable for another person's obligation under contract is assumption. So uh, while assignment is without risk of liability, Novation does release a withdrawing party from liability. And then ostensible liability is again, the broker being liable for any discriminatory discrimination by his agents, whether or not the broker knows about those or not. So that was assumption. All right, so we did not pass financing. So, Let's try it one more time. Because the thing is, and, and if you all have CompuCram, I definitely recommend this. Um, just keep doing, because it'll ask you different questions. And by the time you take the test, you'll find that there are questions on that test that are gonna look very much like the ones you saw. 
So, you know, when you go in and do these over and over again, you'll get different questions almost every time. Some will repeat and it, it'll allow you to really have a good firm understanding of a lot of the questions they'll ask. Okay, a purchaser secured a loan using a deed of trust. Now that the borrower has defaulted on the loan, the trustee finds a buyer to sell the title to. Which instrument did the trustee use to convey title to the new owner? So the purchaser secured a loan using a deed of trust. Now that the borrower has defaulted on the loan, the trustee finds a buyer to sell the title to. So the buyer defaulted and the trustee is selling the loan. So we've got, let's see, anybody answering in there? So one, a quick claim deed. Okay, anyone else? So we got quick claim deed, we've got reconveyance deed, a trustee deed, or a deed of trust. Okay, one's the only answer. It's a trustee deed, because the trustee was the one that was finding someone to sell the vital to. So quick claim deed is used to clear up clouds on a title. You can do quick claim deeds pretty easily. Um, just to reduce uh, people on deeds. Uh, there are lots of reasons people use them. Uh, they, turn, they turn their deeds, their, their uh, ownership into a trust. And so you quit claim it to yourself, into your trust, things like that. So a deed of trust puts the title into the trust where it stays until the loan is satisfied or goes into default. A reconveyance deed gives title to the borrower when he pays off the loan. So in default, the trustee is instructed by the lender to sell the property. When this happens, the trustee uses a trustee deed. So that's the correct answer there. Disintermediation refers to an instrument used in many states in place of a mortgage. The movement of money out of a savings account into a higher yield investment transferring real property by a private owner to a public agency or representing both parties to a transaction. So disintermediation. Anyone? Anyone? Am I just missing the chats here? Four. All right. So representing both parties to a transaction. So not correct. It's the movement of money out of a savings account into a higher yield investment. So, um, it's, it's when you move the money into a higher, that's, and, and again, this is a finance term. So dual agency is representing both parties to a transaction. And a deed of trust, uh, where was that at one? An instrument used in many states in place of a mortgage, and that's a deed of trust. So that's the first one, okay? An alienation clause in a mortgage refers to the clause that one, allows the lender to call for full payment of the mortgage because the owner sold the property, allows the lender to charge a penalty for early payment, calls the entire mortgage due if the owner moves outside of the United States, or pledges the property as security to a third party. And all right, number one, Anyone else? That is correct. So it's often called due on the sale clause. So alienation clause calls the entire mortgage balance due if the property is sold or transferred. Um, so now remember if your client says, hey, I wanna take someone off the deed, make sure they're talking to their lender first, okay? Because uh, you know a lot of times it can become due and payable uh, when those things happen. A lender charges three discount points on a loan. The buyer is buying a $100,000 home is getting an 80% mortgage. 
how much in discount points would the borrower be required to pay? So discount points on a $100,000 home with an 80% mortgage and it's uh, three discount points. So I see number one, $2,400, $3,000, number two, 6,000 or 2,500. All right, number one, that is correct. So discount points in the calculation on the loan amount, not the sale price. So an 80% loan of 100,000 house is $80,000. Each discount point is 1% of the loan amount. Thus, it would be computed that 80,000 times 3% is $2,400. So good answer. A type of financing available for real estate mortgages in which the percentage interest rate will differ from year to year according to terms specified by the lender is known as adjustable rate mortgage, amortized loan, fluctuating loan, or fixed rate mortgage. Adjustable rate mortgage. All right, moving through these quickly. Okay, so uh, I think we pretty much got that one. A person receiving an adjustable rate mortgage would expect to pay only interest each month with the principal paid in one balloon payment at the end of the term, or pay the same amount of interest every month. Number three, see the interest fluctuate on a year-to-year -year basis according to terms specified by the lender. Or number four, pay no interest on the loan. Number three. All right. All right. Yes, that is correct. Which word or clause in a mortgage pledges real property as collateral for the debt? Acceleration, hypothecation, acknowledgement, or accretion? I believe it's accretion. I got C on here, and I heard accretion. It's hypothecation. So hypothecation clause in the mortgage secures the debt by pledging the real property to be the collateral, collateral for the debt. Acknowledgement is when the mortgager signs the mortgage contract in front of a notary public. So oh, somebody threw, threw in B at the end there. <laughs> so and um, acceleration is the due clause where they make it due upon due and payable. And then accretion is the gradual deposit of silt in a waterway. So accretion is the way that sometimes boundary rights can change in waterways because of the silt buildup and that you is essentially get more land. So an investor decides to take money out of a savings account and invest it in high return corporate securities. This movement of money is known as disintermediation discrimination, dedication, or debt service. So we talked about this one in the last go round. So we should all get this one right. And I see number one so far. Hey, all right. So disintermediation, that is correct. And again, this is why I recommend doing these practice exams kind of over and over again, because you'll start to really get a feel for the way they ask the questions and also uh, understand the, the logic behind the, the answers. So the provision on a promissory note or mortgage that calls the entire amount of the unpaid loan balance due upon the happening of a certain event is known as an indemnification clause, acceleration clause, habendum clause, or inchoate clause. Acceleration? Yeah, I see some C's in there. So it's acceleration. Uh, the inchoate refers to an incomplete, uh, an incomplete interest, such as a spouse's dower interest during the lifetime of the owning spouse. Uh, the habendum clause refers to the clause often included after a granting clause in many deeds. So it, it's when it says to have and to hold. So describing the actual type of estate granted. So they'll say to have and hold, and then they'll give the property description. So that's the habendum. Indemnification refers to a personal guarantee to hold a person harmless from any further liability. A buyer is late with his monthly mortgage payment. The lender could declare the entire unpaid loan amount due immediately under which clause? 
All right, so we should all get this one. We've had like three on this one so far, I think. Three or four. Hypothecation. So acceleration. So hypothecation uh, refers to the, remember it's the pledge of, of the property as a security or collateral for the loan. So that's what hypothecation is, acceleration. So when think when it becomes due and payable, you're accelerating the loan all the way to the end and making it due and payable. So an acceleration, think you're just going from start to finish and now you have to pay the full amount. So that's acceleration clause. And that's when it becomes due and payable. All right, so we've gone through finance a couple times. Uh, like I said, in the national exam, it's gonna be finance, contracts, practice of real estate, general principles of agency. Does anyone have a recommendation on what they would like to see? Um, next, so again, contracts, practice of real estate, general principles of agency, or a toss up and I get to pick. Anyone? General agency, all right. Let's go back up, I think it was up there again. Okay, general agency. While a listing agent is showing a rental property, it becomes clear that the buyers are about to disclose a confidentiality. They recently won a large settlement in a personal injury case and have unlimited funds to spend on the property. The agent, one, owes no duty to disclose to the buyers any relationship between the agent and the seller. Number two, should tell the buyers before showing the property not to disclose any confidentiality. Number three is a buyer's agent and will keep the buyer's confidentiality. And number four is a dual agent. So it's okay if the buyer tells the agent this information. What do you think that agent should do? A. Okay. So I see A. So let me ask you, if you're the listing agent and, you know, remember, most law is buyer focused. The buyer, most of the laws are on the buyer's side. So I see just an A so far. So does that listing agent who works for the seller owe no duty to disclose any relationship between the agent and the seller? because they are the seller's agent. Or should they tell the buyers before showing the property not to disclose any confidentiality? So think about when they tell you there's a, there's a booklet and a, a, some paper that you're supposed to give to the buyer before on first contact, on first substantial contact before anything is disclosed to you. Does anybody remember what that is? All right, well, we'll move on. <laughs> and so it, your obligation is always to disclose. So as the buyers are about to tell the sell agent a confidentiality, the agent should tell the buyers before the home is shown that the agent represents the seller and that all confidentialities disclosed to the agent will be told to the seller because your duty is to disclose what you know. And so, and your obligation is to your client. So you have to tell them that it will be disclosed to the seller if told to you. So in this uh, question, the agent is the listing agent. And unless there is a disclosure that the agent is a dual agent, the presumption is that the listing agent represents the seller. During an initial interview, a buyer signs a buyer's agreement with an agent. The agent begins sending this potential buyer some listings from the MLS and the buyer has the agent show her a few properties. Then the buyer asks the agent to negotiate on her behalf and prepare an offer. 
When the agent prepares the offer for the buyer, the agent discloses that he represents the buyer. This type of agency is regarded as listing agency, ostensible agency, actual authority, or universal agency. So we can, we can take a couple off right away because listing, are they listing a property or are they buying a property? Okay. An ostensible agency, we know that that means that, okay, number four, universal. So we got an answer in there. So it's actual authority. So it, the listing agency is between the broker and the seller. Actual authority is when the principal through written instrument gives authority for representation. So uh, an universal agency describes the level of authority of an attorney, uh, an attorney in fact. An ostensible agency is agency without evidence of authority, plausible but not actual representation. So uh, once they made the offer, so once once they asked the buyer asked the agent to negotiate on her behalf and prepare an offer, that's when it actually became actual authority. So the best description of principle is. One, a landlord, two, a customer, three, an owner of real estate, or four, one who employs a broker to represent his interest in matters of real estate. Two, so a customer. Okay, D, I got D in there. One who employs a broker, anyone else? Okay, got two on this one. All right, that is correct. So the agent represents the principal and therefore owes a fiduciary duty to the principal and an agent works with, but not for a customer. A sales agent is selling his own personal home. The condition of which he misrepresents, the agent is sued and raises the defense that he was not acting as an agent in the sale, but was selling his own property personally. The probable outcome of the case is the one, broker will be held liable, two, the sales agent will win, three, sales agent will be held liable, four, case will be dismissed for no cause of action. What do you think? Real estate agent selling their own property, but not acting as an agent but acting as a person selling their own property. Do you think there will be held liable? Will the broker be held liable or will the sales agent be held liable? Or will the agent win or will the case be dismissed? I got one, I got a three. I will say a number three. Number three, I got, we got two for number three. That is correct. So seller's agents are subject to the rules of the professionals of ethics 24 hours a day. So always remember that, um, especially if, uh, you know, because they say that when you go to a property, your first idea should be, should I buy this property and think of it as an investment for yourself? And if, if you don't want to buy it, then think of it, put your real estate hat on. Now, the key to that is remembering that you owe them, uh, Joe Public, the, the responsibility of your ethics and you owe them the right to know the actual value of the property. You can't undercut them. You should always have it in writing, letting them know uh, that that was what value they could achieve on the open market because um, your responsibility is to them. They You're looked at as a professional 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. You're never not a real estate agent once you become one. And when you act as a real estate agent, you can't say you didn't know. Okay. So agents selling their own property are not relieved of their professional or ethical responsibilities. All right. A broker takes a listing from a seller. In the third month of the listing, the seller had a fatal heart attack regarding the listing agreement. Which statement is true? The heirs must work with the broker to get the estate sold. Two, the broker must now reduce the price. Three, 
the broker must remove the sign and the lockbox. Four, the broker must disclose if the seller had the heart attack at the listing. So I see it number three. All right, we'll go with number three. I That's believe fine. it's a number three. All right, you are correct. So the once the person dies, the relationship dies and the agency uh, ends. So that's, uh, that's how that works. The broker, there's no longer an agency relationship once the person dies. In real estate transactions, a real estate salesperson has a direct fiduciary response relationship to the sponsoring broker, one, two, other salespeople participating in the transaction, three, the cooperating broker, or four, the buyer's agent. So the fiduciary relationship. So I see three. I believe it's number one, sponsoring broker. That is correct. So uh, you don't have a fiduciary, you have a fiduciary relationship to your client, but your direct fiduciary relationship is also to your sponsoring broker because other salespeople, you don't have a fiduciary relationship to them. The cooperating broker on the other side, you don't have that same thing. And the buyer's agent, uh, you don't have that same thing. So uh, it is to your sponsoring broker. A broker charges a fee to assist parties to a potential real estate transaction and communicating negotiating and performing terms of an agreement. Yet, the broker is not representative of either party. In this situation, the broker would be defined as a, one, seller's agent, two, dual agent, three, buyer's agent, or four, facilitator. So I see four. I believe it's number right. four, first. Yep, number four is correct. So, uh, you know, the seller is represented by a broker under the terms of a listing agreement. A buyer is represent represented by a broker under a buyer broker contract. Dual agent is when the broker represents both the buyer and the seller in the same transaction. Now, when the broker is just helping the parties of a potential real estate transaction, they are a facilitator. A licensed real estate salesperson is permitted by law to represent one or more brokers, two, any interested party, three, his sponsoring broker only, four, himself as a broker. So how many are you allowed to represent? So I see three in there. Correct. So you are only allowed to represent your broker only. And if you want to change, you would have to submit a, a change request with the state and then they can change you over to another brokerage. Uh, you can do it online or you can mail that in. In a listing agreement, the sales agent is described as the sub agent one, two agent, three principal or four buyer's agent. One, so sub-agent, anyone else? Anyone? So it's interesting and this one trips up a lot of people. So we got number one, it's gonna be correct. Now, an agent is a sub-agent in the listing and the listing belongs to the broker and thus the broker is the agent and the sales agent is an agent of the broker making him a sub-agent under the broker. A person who is known as an attorney, in fact, is someone who has one, power of attorney, two, general agency, three, special agency, or four, implied authority. So remember, they're an attorney in fact.
Okay, I see one. Okay. So an attorney, in fact, isn't, well, it is. I thought it was going to be special uh, general agency, but yeah, it's been a while. <laughs> so a person who has power of attorney is known as an attorney, in fact. Good job. All right, so much better on general practices. Um, we're at the end of the hour, we started late, so I'm happy to do one more. Uh, if you wanna tell me which one you wanna do, I'm happy to do another one. So again, we just went through general, or we did the practice of real estate. Um, so general principles of agency, sorry. So we've got practice of real estate left, or contracts. So, uh, which which ones do you want to see? Contracts or practice of real estate? I mean, if everybody's agreed to it, I would like to see contract. I mean, if it's okay. Well, you're the one talking, so squeaky wheel gets the grease. All right. Interesting. Viewed 17 times. Yeah, why is this like this? I go back. In a face-to-face -face meeting, a farmer offers to pay a roofer $1,500 to install a roof on his barn. The roofer says, I'll do it tomorrow. Which type of contract do they have? There we go. All right. So this is contracts. So a seller signs an exclusive agency agreement with a broker. The day after the listing is signed, the seller's brother-in-law decides to make an offer on the property without knowing that the property has been listed. Which statement is true? The seller will have to pay the commission to the broker, number one. Number two, the broker is not entitled to a commission. Number three, the buyer will have to pay a commission. Number four, since a buyer was found during the listing period, the broker will be entitled to a commission. So which do you think is true? So they signed us an exclusive agency agreement with the broker. And the listing was signed and then the seller's brother-in-law decides to make an offer on the property. So I believe the, the broker is in, is entitled the whole commission. All right. So broker entitled to a commission. Incorrect. The broker is not entitled to a commission. So under an exclusive agency agreement, the broker is entitled to a commission only if the broker or other agency finds a buyer for the seller. So in this situation, the seller found the buyer and does not owe a commission. If this were an exclusive right to sell listing, the seller would have to pay the broker commission no matter who found the buyer. So remember, they signed an exclusive agency agreement, not an exclusive right to sell agreement. So that's the difference. And remember, they're gonna use these to kind of trip you up. So that's, that's where that's gonna happen is you gotta know the differences between your agreements because these are contracts. All right, so a broker deposits a buyer's $500 earnest money check into the broker's personal checking account. The broker is guilty of one, cooperation, two, condemnation, three, commingling, or four, capitalization. I might just put in three. Three would be correct. So commingling is the mixing of personal funds with the broker's trust account funds. So condemnation is the act of the government taking private property for public use and cooperation is when two brokers work together on the sale. Capitalization is a pro uh, process to determine present market value from a future time. A lender qualifies a new borrower who signs a note and mortgage. Then the same terms of the note and mortgage are transferred to a new mortgagor, relieving the original mortgagor of liability. This is known as 
defeasance, assignment, subrogation, or novation. So I see somebody put in number two. Anything else? Number two, assignment. That is incorrect. Novation. So when, when you're relieving the original mortgager of liability, that's novation. So substitution of new contract with the withdrawing, withdrawing party relieved of liability is novation. So assignment is the transfer of one's property interest. So that's when you're assigning it to someone else. Uh, the assigner is not relieved of liability. So uh, when you assign it, you are not relieved of your liability. You're only relieved of liability when you have novation. Um, so subrogation is the substitution of one creditor for another. So you're just transferring one creditor with another. The second creditor having the same legal claims and rights uh, you know, as the first. So in the defeasance clause declares that a mortgage is satisfied when the final payment is made. The law requiring certain real estate contracts to be in writing to be enforceable is called one, statute of frauds, two, statute of limitations, three, written instrument law, or four, parole evidence rule. So A, statute of frauds, that is correct. So a statute of limitation places a limit on the amount of time that can go by after an incident where a lawsuit can be filed. Uh, the parole evidence rule prohibits oral testimony from creating terms in an otherwise unwritten or otherwise written contract. And then there's no such thing as a written instrument law. Uh, so the statute of frauds pertains to contracts to buy, sell, or exchange real estate, but does not pertain to listings. So just know that um, it doesn't pertain to listings, but it does pertain to contracts to buy, sell, or exchange real estate. So a listing isn't actually a contract to buy, sell, or exchange. You're just marketing a property for sale. An agreement of sale is a contract between a seller, buyer, and a mortgagee, seller and broker, buyer and seller, buyer and broker. So who is an agreement of sale or contract between? All right, I see A. Anyone else? So when you think of your purchase agreements, who's listed on the purchase agreement? So I've got seller A. and buyer. Buyer and seller, correct. Because it's not, you know, because the mortgagee, uh, you're not adding a bank into that. You're just doing the buyer and seller. When an offer is presented, the seller may, one, make a counter offer, two, all of the answers listed, three, reject the offer, or four, accept the offer so it becomes a contract. So... Which one is it? B. Yes. That is correct. So there are always three choices. You can accept, reject, or counter. A commercial broker listed a storefront for rent. A tenant was procured. After the lease was signed, the owner refused to pay the listing broker. In order to obtain her fee, the broker could, one, sue in criminal court because the fee was $30,000, two, place a lien on the property, four, three, file a complaint with the Division of Real Estate, or four, sue for specific performance. What do you all think? D. All right, I got a D in there. So it's puts a lien on the property. So commercial lien law permits a broker to lien a piece of commercial property if she is under contract and has earned her fee, but the owner refuses to pay. This is not true of residential property. So that's, that's the difference between the commercial, the fact that this was commercial and not residential. The broker would have to file a, a suit in civil court to obtain her fees in a residential dispute. 
So again, it wouldn't be criminal court and uh, filing a complaint with the division of real estate doesn't do anything because the seller isn't, uh, isn't bound by the division of real estate. So, you know, this does pertain um, to you know, specific performance is usually when um, suing for performance is if like someone doesn't honor the contract on the buyer seller side. If upon a receipt of purchase under certain terms, the seller makes a counteroffer, the prospective purchaser is, if upon a receipt of purchase under certain terms, the seller makes a counteroffer, the prospective purchaser is one, bound to accept the counteroffer, two, relieved of the original offer, three, bound by the original offer, or four, bound by the agent's decision. Two, yes. They are relieved of that offer. As soon as a counter offer is made, the original offer becomes null and void. Counter offers are rejections of the offer made. A buyer made an earnest deposit of $500 on a $40,000 house, but withdrew the offer before the seller accepted it. The broker should dispose of the buyer's earnest money by one, paying it to the court, two, returning it to the buyer, three, giving it to the seller, and four, keeping it as part of his commission. This one can be tricky. So what do we got? I don't see any answers yet. I see a B. All right. So returning it to the buyer. And this is, you know, if it was, if the, Anytime the sale goes through or the contract is made, yes, you would then have to give it, your obligation is actually to give it to the seller. So as there is no contract, it is to be returned to the buyer. So if the, like it says, if the offer had been accepted, then the broker would need to pay the earnest money deposit to the court or hold the earnest money until a written agreement by both parties instruct the broker what to do with the earnest money. The term specific performance refers to, so we just kind of talked about this, a legal procedure or action brought by either the buyer or seller to enforce the terms of the contract, the agreement of all parties of the contract, the right of either party to cancel the contract provided legal notices given, or an executed contract in which all elements of the contract have been specifically fulfilled. So A, yes. So. Is that me? That is me. <laughs> Hang on. There we go. All right. Apparently it will not stop ringing on my computer though. All right, there we go. Okay, so yeah, specific report performance is a remedy at law that would require one party to specifically perform his obligation as called under the contract. So make the seller sign the deed as they promised. So uh, if they get to closing and the seller's like, I'm just not going to sign and the buyer's gone through all the steps, this, they would sue for specific performance. All right. Earnest money is best described as the consideration for the sale of the property Two, the money deposited by the purchaser with the broker seller to pay for the expense of examining title. Three, the commission paid to the broker, or four, good faith money deposited by the purchaser at the time of signing the offer. Four. All right, correct. So earnest money is not required. Uh, it's best described as money deposited by the purchaser with the signing of the offer. Uh, it is due at signing. So just remember that because that can cause troubles if your client does not give their earnest money uh, in a timely fashion. Uh, the, it can invalidate the, the offer or the contract. So uh, it is not part of the consideration, nor is it to be kept by the broker if the transaction fails. Mary buys Sally's property, which is subject to a mortgage. After five years of payment, Mary defaults and misses a payment, 
which is the appropriate remedy for the original mortgagor. So remember, Sally's property had a mortgage and you know, after five years, uh, Mary defaults. So sue Mary and Sally as they are both liable on the mortgage. Sue only Mary as she assumed Sally's mortgage. Sue only Sally as Mary took only the property subject to a mortgage and there was no assumption. The mortgager has no recourse since there was no assumption. So I see a number two. So since there was no assumption, the mortgager has no recourse. So in this question, Sally is the mortgagor. Most people confuse mortgagor and mortgagee. In this case, the mortgagee is the bank. The question plainly states that Mary bought Sally's property, which was subject to a mortgage. It does not state that there was any loan assumption. Thus, Sally remains totally liable on the loan and cannot sue Mary. The bank, which is the mortgagee, can sue only Sally as there was no assumption. A seller signs an exclusive right to sell listing agreement with a broker. However, the seller's brother-in-law makes an offer on the property the next day, not realizing it had been placed in a listing. We did this one, so everyone should get the right answer. So the broker is entitled to a commission, the seller will not have right. to pay a commission, or the broker is not entitled to a commission, or since the seller found the buyer, the listing is void. Who knows the answer to this one? So I see one, seller is entitled, the broker is entitled to a commission. And you would be correct because this one, instead of an agency agreement, is an exclusive right to sell listing agreement. So yes, in an exclusive right to sell, the broker is entitled regardless of who finds the buyer. A seller signs a listing agreement that commences today and ends on December 31st of this year. The listing agent tries as hard as possible, but simply cannot find a buyer who is interested in the property. After the first of the year, the listing is terminated by one, seller rescission, two, expiration, three, unilateral agreement, or four, statute of fraud. All right. Expiration, correct. I saw number two in there. So the listing expires. And, you know, and I'll tell you as agents, that's one of the best things to go after are expired listings. Those are all people who've had their hand up and say they want to sell their property. They just didn't do it for one reason or another. So it's a great way to get your business started. It's how I started a business was uh, for sale by owners and expireds. All right. If a broker receives two offers for the same house at the same time, one from the agent of a cooperating broker and another from his own agent, the broker should, one, submit the cooperating broker's offer to the seller first, two, submit both offers, three, submit his agent's offer to the seller first, or four, reject both offers. Number two. Number two, that is correct. So you're required to submit all offers. And remember, one of the things I always told my sellers was, look, if someone tells me, if someone puts it in writing that they're offering you $50 for your $500,000 property, I am obligated to send it to you. So don't kill the messenger, <laughs> you know? So it doesn't matter what the offer is or who's offering it, you submit all offers to your client. All right, so that was uh, contracts and you all had that one pretty well. Uh, so that's still a passing grade on that one. Now, uh, any questions, I'll, I'll, answer, I'll give you five minutes for any questions that you have. Uh, so any questions, go ahead and throw them in the chat or take yourself off mute and uh, feel free to ask. And if not, have a good night. I and have a quick see. question. Yeah. So where I can get the compu cramped so that way I can practice and practice and practice and over, over 
in my house so, and stuff. So Hondros uh, has one. Uh, I think uh, CE, um, they have one as well. Uh, so you can you can get get it through them. Uh, you have to purchase it. Uh, and again, it was something that I did uh, multiple times, and I just made sure I got ninety percent or better on on them. You know, I just took the practice test over uh, these practice tests over and over again, and then I took the actual full exam um, once I was really com competent in all the practice exams. And remember, they change, so uh, you can get you can get it from the CE class or you can get it from Hondros. Uh, but those are the two that I know of. Uh, I got mine through Hondros. Heard that, understand. Thank you so much. No problem. Anyone else? All right. Well, thanks for being here. Thank you for your patience. And um, yeah, if there are any questions you all have or any help that you need, feel free to reach out. Uh, we're here to help see you get through the process and uh, become real estate agents. All right. We well, all have a great evening. Thanks so much.